Okay, so all our participants are joining us now. Okay, we've 122 now logged on all around the world. Very good. Good evening to all of them, or good afternoon, or wherever they are. Okay, great. Okay, well, we might kick off. So welcome to week three of the Art of the Mating. Each week, we have been trying to give everyone a bit of a distraction and learn something along the way where we've been having a look at pedigrees. And today we're having a look at confirmation. So we're, build, we're taking the building blocks of what we learned in the first two weeks and we're having a look at the physical of the horse. And who better to look at that than our three panelists today? We have Marek Farrell, Mags O'Toole and Nick Nugent, three great judges of, uh, worldwide in the game. Um, and they're here and they have looked at their homework and they will be discussing the three horses we had assigned to you. And we'll also be talking kind of more generally, taking your questions the whole time about what to look for in a horse. So. As before, if you see the Q&A function on your screen, uh, you can click that and you can answer, ask any question you want. Um, and our experts will be here to open it. I, they, they then appear on my screen and I'll, I'll uh, ask the experts how, as many as I can over the course of the next hour. So week three and our, every week, as you know, we have a different briefing. And this briefing is about finding the athlete, finding that good looking horse and where do we start? Well, we start with the good. We try and find that good looking horse that we say we're excited to sell, uh, to sell this horse to you, to uh, breed this horse. And that what we all strive to do in the industry is produce. Moret, I, I think for anyone that comes, looks at this horse instantaneously, they, they think that is a handsome horse, that is a good looking horse. But uh, a horse like this, that see the stars, what is it instantly that you look at and think he is a good looking horse? Oh, the first thing you think is what beautiful balance he has. And the second thing that comes to my mind is the presence that he has. And I don't know, let's imagine, I don't know who this horse is. Um, they're the two things that I would look for when I'm looking at any yearling because I always try to look for the, the big picture first and then figure out what's going to come after that. So for me, he's got a beautiful long neck, lovely shoulder, great balance front end to rear end, great forearm, great gaskin, lovely eye, lovely head. Um, expression is very important to me because that tells you about the class of the horse. So for me, not knowing who this horse is, um, if he was a yearling, I, he would be on my list for sure. And Nick, your job, you have to, every year you have to go and assemble the finest yearlings you can find to fill our Orby sale every year and get people excited about coming to Ireland and buying these yearlings. What, when you step into a field with you know, breeders throughout Ireland, what are the things you immediately look to in a horse to think this could be one for the Orby? Well, it's, it's extraordinary, Jack, that you started with this horse. So I think you said was See the Stars. Um, and is it See the Stars? It is See the Stars, yeah. Yeah, because I, I thought, gosh, that's a good looking horse. And I have to tell you, I looked at See the Stars when he was a yearling in the Irish National Stud. And I inspected him. And I came back to Goffs, I remember. I can't, I think Matt Mitchell was running the company then. And I said, I've seen the best looking yearling I've ever seen. I've seen, I think I said, I've seen the most valuable yearling I've ever seen. Now let's face it, he was a half brother to Galileo at that stage. So it wasn't an enormously um, brilliant piece of pedigree analysis to work that one out. But he was the most beautiful yearling um, that I think to this day I've ever seen. You know, he, well, in terms of mixing his pedigree and his confirmation. So, of all the horses in the whole world that you've to start with, you've actually started with the best 
most exciting, I mean, I had th thought for a lovely moment we might be able to persuade Mrs. Choi that she might want to sell the horse and that then we would have the honor of doing that. But that didn't happen and she sensibly hung on to him. But I mean, he's, he is just, he is the magnificent beast because obviously he doesn't walk out of a, th these horses weren't shown in a field. I mean, he was marched up and down. You could get the full, like your video, you get a full confirmation or thing. He, he was without fault, in my opinion. Um, but he is, I mean, he is really, he's, you've started off with Ronaldo there. And, uh, you know, we started with the very best. What I'm looking for when I go out to a field for golfs is, um, unfortunately, it's not always about assembling the best horses we've seen because there are other sales that also attract vendors' attention. But you're obviously trying to find horses that not, I know this isn't a pedigree analysis, but the fact is that you, you want to have a pedigree page that doesn't prevent somebody going to the stable in the first place. And when the stable door opens, that they're sufficiently interested by the pedigree page to have gone to the stable in the first place. You want an animal that walks out looking like this, basically. Okay, great. I think, Mags, if we turn to you, I think what's fascinating about your career is you have to take these good looking animals and you look at you foals, you look at yearlings, you look at store horses, you look at horses in training, but throughout that whole spectrum of what you're looking at, it's, at the end of the day, it's a horse. And what are the consistent things you look for in an animal that you say, that is something that is besides me, that is a good looking horse? Um, movement is my huge criteria, Jack, whether they're foals to yearlings, yearlings to breeze up horses or store horses. Um, if a horse can't move, he's of no use to me. Okay, short and sweet. And I think that's something that we consistently see all the whole time. It's movement. And what gets in the way of movement? And I suppose that is the bad. That is what we're discussing today. It's confirmation. It's the different traits that a horse might have as a result of uh, perhaps their pedigree. Uh, that, that is something that might restrict them going fast and winning races. And I suppose a question from Stephen Giles um, and perhaps Moret, you could answer this, is what are faults that are listed here, perhaps, or you know something else you could think of that you'd be willing to forgive in a racehorse? It's frequently cited as people as an you know something you don't want, but actually in Moret Farrell's book, you don't really mind too much. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. A lot of people say they don't like back of the knee, and I think there are degrees of back of the knee, and I have no problem with a flat kneed horse. My only issue would be if they're a heavy bodied horse and they might have a banana knee, as in the banana backwards. Um, I also am not that harsh on horses that are not perfect in front because I believe the power comes from behind, the impetus comes from behind, and the front is a fulcrum. So I, if they move well through certain things like an offset knee, as long as it's not crooked offset, I will accept that. Um, I am okay with long pasterns, but I don't like slack pasterns. So there's degrees and variations of certain faults that I will certainly live with. And Marek, when you, when you talk about a slack pastern, what, what is that? What does that kind of look? So we can see the pastern angles over here to the, to the left-hand side. Okay. What, what, is it, what is that? Slack is when it's long enough where it, there's movement with the ankle. So the ankle actually moves up and down. Sometimes you'll see a long-ish pastern, but there's no looseness there. And it's the looseness, in my opinion, causes issues with ankles and things like that. And trainers find it hard to keep them sound. And, and Mags, I kind of turn to you and, and just picking up on what Moret is finishing with there, things that are, you know, you've seen over your career that, trainers struggle with to keep horses sound? Are there particular traits that you think are a no-no in your book that you kind of go, oh, that's an X in my catalogue page. I don't think I'll be able to live with that. Well, I'm afraid back of the knee is my absolute hatred, Jack. Um, okay, okay, in yeah. contrast, yeah. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you know, I'm not great on long sloping pastures either, but, you know, there are degrees. And as Moret says, it depends whether there's a lot of movement or not a lot of movement. Um, and especially from my national hunt point of view, a bad hind leg and Kirby hocks are more or less a no-no. It just doesn't work. And when you talk about movement, Mags, I suppose to delve a little bit deeper into that, is that, is that 
an overstride? What what is good movement for you? What are you kind of looking at as a yearling marches up and down in front of you that you're kind of going, this horse can walk? Well, a horse with good movement, I think, always has what we say a swing to them, and everything everything moves in the well in the right way. And there's you know well, basically everything moves rather than a horse with a short, stilty walk or a hind leg that doesn't follow through. It's a horse that's supple and and has a good movement. You know where everything is fluid. And Nick, when you're, you know, approaching sales time and you're reviewing these yearlings, are there particular traits, Russell Proven has asked me this question uh, on our Q&A platform, are there questions, you know, faults that you go, that's a no-no, that's not going to be an Orbe yearling that you really, really would be against in terms of a, a selling that horse? Well, I think when you're dealing with select sales, wherever in the world you're dealing with them, you know, my experience is not the same as Moretz and Magsies because I don't buy horses for the end users. I'm like a... I'm like a kind of buyer for a, a supermarket or a fashion chain. I'm not trying to buy what I want to wear. I'm trying to buy what Moret and Mags want to wear. Um, and it, so you're trying to create horses that will stimulate comp you know, competitive bidding within the market. So the first thing you're trying to do is find a reason um, to minimize the amount of reasons that Mags and Moret and their many colleagues buying horses don't want to buy a horse. You know. Um, some of the horses that we are going to be looking at later on, you know, for all I know, the market, you know, sometimes, well, we'll get to them in due course, but, you know, you've got to try and put together the best catalogue of horses that are available to you that people may want to buy for as close to the target average price that your colleagues and you have set as your target for the sale. I don't think that makes any difference whether you work for Magic Millions or Inglis or Keeneland or Fazig or Tadassos or Goss or Arcana. We all have our aspirational targets for our sales in the year ahead and we try and complete catalogues that will achieve those targets and so there you see a, a yearling like see the stars just now he's a perfect horse he's a brother to galileo he was by cape cross who at the time had recently previously said ouija board he had all the makings of being a, a yearling that anyone who wanted to pay in excess of a million for would all want to buy whereas a slack paston or a horse that's back of its knee is immediately evident or a horse with a poor walk, even from these two buyers we're hearing tonight. Those are both, you know, if I, if we put, if we fill a cattle with horses that are bad walkers, Mags isn't going to buy any of them. If we have a horse that's got a banana leg, Moret's not going to buy one. So there's kind of, you, you, you try and acquire a knowledge, even just sometimes by years of experience of what people do and don't want to buy. And I think that the advantage that some of us have, those of us who are auctioneers, it's not a particular advantage. And a lot of my most talented colleagues aren't auctioneers, but I spend an awful lot of time on the rostrum trying to sell horses that I've seen not only six months before, but probably three hours before. And I can translate how the physical animal that I see presented for sale actually converts into demand in terms of real bidding. So if I'm selling a cracking nice foal and it's a nice cult foal and it's pedigree is passable. I know 40 people are going to be in to buy that foal and I pretty well can write down who those 40 are going to be. Um, it, it's the other ones, therefore, the ones that have little bits of holes in them, you've got to make sure the holes aren't too big. It's a bit like holes in a net. And tell us, when you're made doing that pros, how big a role does pedigree play in the kind of also reviewing the confirmation of a horse? Well, I mean, a pedigree is, is, is obviously is the is the addition, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's the um, pedigree only allows you to say how, how, how high a price may go. It doesn't stop it going any lower. I mean, a terrible looking well-bred animal is just a terrible looking animal and is really worth anything. But two beautiful animals, one with, by, you know, one by a Cape Cross out of Urban Sea and one by Nick Nugent out of the Batty Mare. <laughs> There's no comparison, you know. Um, One's worth millions and one is just a beautiful horse with no pedigree. And there's a capacity to what that beautiful horse can make, depending on the momentum of the market. You know, you could sell a very, very nice yearling colt in Doncaster, where traditionally people will always look at animals with a, perhaps a kinder eye in terms of pedigree. And a nice colt there can make, you know, a certain amount of money, but it's only a minor fraction of what a very well-bred colt can make at uh, a similar yearling sale anywhere in the world. And a filly. Go ahead. 
Uh, Do you want my Mar- opinion on sorry, that sorry to cut across in Nick, but uh, Moret, I, 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 an achievement you had last year, which was you bought a five a horse that was a five thousand dollar yearling that you had the belief that wait, I'm going to pay sixty thousand dollars for this five thousand dollar yearling, and that horse is going to go on and win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. You know, how do you, how do you, what is that process that you think, wow, this guy paid $5,000 for what must have been, a, I, look, I have, I've never seen Storm to Court, mm-hmm. but, you know, there must have been faults there that perhaps led to that valuation, that, that you had the, the belief to think, right, this could be a runner, and it did, it did because it won a Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Right. Well, first of all, he actually was a very handsome, is a very handsome horse. But he was, like what Nick talked about, he was the white page that you see, that you flick over and say, no, it'll never be anything. But the beauty of the two-year-old sales are that you can look at the videos, and I'm a huge videoite when it comes to the two-year-old sales. I study them over and over and over again. And this horse, this As my oh, the white page and thought, <laughs> well, I don't know about this. <laughs> but I, the, it was the video that brought me to see the horse. And when I saw him at the barn, he blew me away because like what Mag said about the movement, I'm huge on movement too. And he went up and down in three strides. He was so smooth. And I like to be close to them. When I stepped into him, he was so classy and very confident, clean limbed. Um, there was nothing confirmationally against this horse. It was just that he was by a sire that really hadn't done a whole lot, except that one of my clients, Sean Fitzhenry, had the best court vision ever. And he was out of a mare by Tahana Run, and she was, that's a really, that's Blushing Groom's family. So there were things that I looked for to convince myself that this horse might be a nice horse, <laughs> because it took a lot of convincing. I do like pedigree. And maybe five or six generations down the way, he actually does go back to um, Alice Springs that George Strawbridge had, um, Assertive Lad and Assertive Lass that Gay Waterhouse had. So there were a lot of top class horses way off the page. And that gave me confidence that he may, he could be a good horse. I had no idea he'd win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, but what I was trying to do was buy a good horse for my clients at a reasonable price. And Mags, I, I actually, uh, on the uh, on a kind of longer night that we're having uh, lately, I was reading my history of goths, which I do on a monthly basis. And I was fascinated to read um, about back a while ago now, when you were assisting Hamish Alexander, that you did a very short, I did a short list for him. And right at the top of that short list was a flashy chestnut called Generous, who went on to win a derby. What was it when you look at when you when you saw generous that you kind of went this could be a runner? You know, I can remember him now, and I can remember what barn he was in, which means I am one hundred and thirty six years of age. Um, <laughs> the one thing we really had to get through, which and the thing with Hamish was obviously they were all for resale, and it's very very different. You know, Nick is looking at horses for his sale. We're nearly always looking at a horse for resale, and they're very different, those horses. The one thing we had to try and get through with Generous was his color because it really wasn't nice. And I don't care what anyone says. I know people will tell you a horse has no idea what color he is, but you know, looking at that picture of See the Stars earlier, that beautiful, beautiful bay with black points, I mean, it's just, it catches me every time. But you know, generous, he was a Kerlian, Ker- Ker- Dot the Derby, wonderful family, um, and a very, very nice foal. You just had to close your eyes to his colour. Yeah. And Nick, I sp- uh, Samantha Cripps has a, asked a very good question. And what she's asking, pedigree, do you really, do you want it to align when you look at a horse? Do you want to see, that's a, that's a Kodiak, that's a, that's a smaller physical sprinting type, that's what, or do you want to see, is that very important that it matches to what you expect when it comes out of the barn? Well, I think you always want the horse to be good looking. I think you can be forgiving of certain faults if you, you know, I mean, it's very well, all very well having a, a confirmational discussion, but I mean, confirmation has to be taken in the context of the genetics behind it as well, because I mean, there are certain horses that can have a plain head or be back of their knee or maybe, um, 
you know, offset of their knees or things. I mean, it is completely, I mean, there are certain, I mean, we're going to go and look at three horses in particular, I think, later on, aren't we? Of yours, yeah. Jeff? And I mean, you know, they, they represent, you know, one of them represents a sire line where you might see a lot of characteristics in a head that might be more forgivable than it would in another line. Others can be in their knees. You know, some of the great sire lines can be bad in the knees. I mean, there's an element of hocus pocus about this as well. I mean, the lady who asked the question, I mean, I, years ago when I started looking at horses and you look at them and sometimes when you're looking at them with the auctioneer's hat on, you're looking at hundreds of them in a day, really, that you're going to sell. And you have to go through the motion of being passionately interested, although actually it's a, um, it, it, it becomes quite repetitive sometimes. And sometimes it's not always as informative as it might be. And I remember when I used to be auctioning in Australia that, you know, eventually you would, I'd looked at all these horses and I didn't really know the pedigrees very well because I was a guest auctioneer and they were up in Queensland. And eventually, I just remember being told years ago, if you can't think of anything, say, look at the second dam and look at the sire of the second dam or the third dam. So let's just say it was, I don't know, Lomond or Spectre, you know, and the bloke would be saying to me, what do you think of him then? And I'd say, I can see a lot of Lomond in his hind leg, which was complete and utter bunkum. But I said it was sufficient authority that the bloke would, like the emperor's clothes, they would clo they'd go, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, I can see that. And you're thinking, I can't see it, you can't see it, you've never heard of Lomond, I've only just, whatever it might be. So I'm not there to forgive, really. Um, I would be, uh, you know, you, 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 I wouldn't, I certainly would forgive a fault that you could align to the family or the sire. And I'm sure the others would be the same with that. You know, if a Kodiak, you're suggesting that Kodiaks can be small. I'm, uh, I'm actually have a Kodiak in training of my own now. I mean, it's, it, it is seen as acceptable for a Kodiak perhaps to be small in a way that it isn't for other sires, but it doesn't mean that your Kodiak will be small. Okay, great. Well, these are our confirmation falls, and I just want to kind of touch upon the ugly. When you have a fall and it comes out like this, and it's just, you know, it, it's not a runner. It's, you know, it, it doesn't look like it's, uh, it's where it's meant to be. When you have really significant confirmation falls, Moresh, like what, and you know, especially at an early developmental stage, is there anything you can do? Are there, there processes that uh, breeders should be thinking about? Well, they say never look at that fall again for a month and then come back and see how much it will change. And that does often happen. Then, of course, if it comes to the point where you need to do something with, say, an ankle, um, that they're towing out or to towing in, that is the first thing that must be addressed if you're going to do some surgery to correct that by putting a screw in or whatever. Um, they say with knees to leave them until they're yearlings because they're the last parts to close. And, um, you know, personally, I, I, I've been lucky to be around a lot of breeders that race and it's amazing what the horses will do to rectify themselves as they go along if they're left alone and I'm a big believer in that I know that people have to do things for the market but if you can guide channel things and with the help of your blacksmith and good nutrition good land um, a lot can be overcome in my opinion and Moresh, Meg, Meg hires at a question which was for you, is there are confirmational defects that actually do well in racing? You know, she's she suggested that historically in American dirt racing, slight knock knees seem to stay much sounder than bow legged ones. Is that something you've? Is, are there any right. faults like that that are counterintuitive that you've seen that actually work well? Yeah, I've heard things like that and short pasterns and you know the big muscular rear end, but personally. The, mo the majority of injuries that happen to horses in America are knees. <laughs> um, mm. And that's what stops them eventually. So I, I am careful about knees, personally. Um, I can't honestly say an athlete is an athlete, whether they run on the grass or the dirt. Their makeup, their physical makeup might be slightly different. They're more muscular to get through the dirt day after day training wise. Um, they, you can get away with a little longer pastern on the grass, um, not slack, um, a little lighter body maybe, you know, the dirt, they have to be stronger to, to, but I think an athlete is an athlete. I'm not sure that there's, 
I'm probably not answering this question properly, but I'm no, not no, sure. No, 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 you are absolutely, you are absolutely. Uh, and I suppose, Mags, what I'd be interested, you know, you're sometimes faced with the sales, you have a nervous vendor, and then this magical sight of a stethoscope emerges, and there's someone vetting your horse. Would you, is vetting something that you rely on? Is it an important part of the process for you? Or how do you approach it from a, a buyer perspective? Well, there's certainly in the national hunt world, there's so much pre-vetting done now. So they they come from home with their certificate and then they're re-examined at the sale. So, you know, you've got two certificates now. So you should be pretty happy with that. Um, from a yearling point of view, I think, you know, we all know in the industry that there are some stallions who, you know, don't pass on the greatest of throats. Um, and if that is the case, and if a horse is renowned for it, or even there's small talk about it, um, I'm very inclined to have them scoped. Um, after that, you know, eyes, heart, you know, that's probably all I'd have done. And um, yeah, I think the scope is probably where I stop with them. And just for some people that might not know the detail, it might be not as involved as in the industry as others, a bad throat. And what would that mean for the, the ability of a horse to, to run in a race and to win races? Well, obviously, you know, the um, breathing in a horse, and I don't care whether they're going five furlongs or five miles, is so important because at any stage when they either hold their breath in the flat race or if they're getting tired in a jumping race, um, it's hard enough to get them home when there's nothing wrong with them. But if they can't breathe or if it's been in any way, um, you know, in any way not helping, um, there are going to be no races to win. And Keelan Ford had a question for you, Mags, which was, is there anything for, from a store perspective to a yearling that you'd overlook or vice versa? Is there, there are traits that you kind of go in a, in a store I wouldn't mind or... In a yearling, I wouldn't mind. I know you've said the back of the knee is a complete no-no. Is there anything else that you kind of go, oh, this is actually okay in this, this scenario? Um, I, a horse of towing out um, isn't the end of the world. I can't, towing in or towing in badly doesn't do it for me. There's way too much pressure on them then. But I mean, obviously not to the Charlie Chaplin stage of towing out, but you know, I'll put up with that. Um, and like we said earlier, you know, some stallions that I'm right with Nick. Kodiak was a horse I had in my mind. Nobody's for one minute saying that they're all small. They've all got enough, plenty of size, but you're very unlikely going to see a big Kodiak. And in the national hunt world, and I'm sure Simon Sweeting won't shoot me for this, you expect a cave Tara to have a pretty ordinary hind leg, if not, you know, a hop that's a long way behind him, because that's what he does. But Hey, he's some stallion. I uh, I read a quote from Fonzie O'Brien today, which was uh, which Sonny Carey tweeted, which was, "If size was all that mattered, um, a cow would un uh, outrun a rabbit." Which I thought was, <laughs> which was a very good quote that I'll be storing the next time I have a midget yearling to sell. <laughs> um, but speaking of yearlings to sell, we will move on to our three pieces of homework so these are three horses what we've done is we've picked three horses that we know are all with johnny murta so we have a controlled environment so whoever what horse we pick tonight is going to be in with the tra same trainer and we should find out which was the most talented horse from our detailed confirmation view by via just one video which is always i i uh, agree a bit of a challenge but it's all about trying to learn as best we can and i suppose if we just watch this video, this is the Night of Thunder Cult.
There you have it, the Knight of Thunder cult. Um, we had some great uh, analysis of this cult. We had over 150 pieces of homework. Um, Ronan Woods, Alan Hannigan, Katie Doerr, I thought they all did great pieces of work in terms of this Knight of Thunder. Um, and Moretta, I might turn to you. When you were watching that video, what was the first things that came to mind as you, you looked at that cult? Well, when I look at the cult standing, I think that he's got a beautiful profile, nice neck, a little thick through his gullet, flat through his knee, um, shortish shoulder, good rear end. So, I, you know, when I see him standing, I think, mm, he's okay. I, 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 you know, there are lots of things to like about this horse. When I see him moving, I feel that he, he's not strong enough behind. He doesn't track up enough and he doesn't push off enough from behind. He does use his shoulder quite well. So for me, I wish that he was a little more together front end to back end. And if we delve a little bit further into that, so you know, you're saying he doesn't have, and you've talked previously about how important the hind end is when you re uh, right. look at a horse. But mm -hmm. would, is that something that develops over time or is that something if you don't have the engine behind, you're never going to get it and it just wouldn't be a horse for you? Um, you can, he, he actually, I think he, he, um, might need a little help behind. <laughs> so okay. probably if you build him up a little more behind, it, it would help him some. Um, but yeah, for me, everything is behind. That's where the propulsion is. And Nick, and he does have a good I, 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 you can see that he's, he's got a really, really striking shape and it does have a good Gaskin, I suppose. Nick, but Knight of Thunder, you know, I'm, I, I'd breed every mare I could to him because he's such good value at the moment. But he isn't the most correct horse himself. And I'm sure Darley wouldn't shoot me of saying that he was a 30 grand Dubawi, which is a very rare uh, statement to make about any Dubawi. Um, is that something you'd be thinking with a Knight of Thunder that you might forgive him if he, if he was a little bit uh, not on the correct side? Are you talking to me? Yes, Nick, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would have seen this horse as a yearling um, in the field. I remember seeing him. And by the time I saw him, Knight of Thunder was already beginning to get some scores up. And so, you know, when you go and look at a Knight of Thunder cult, um, and you can't ignore the fact that, you know, he's, he's out of a Teofilo mare, um, nice pedigree. Um, he was a second foal, I think, of the mare. You know, he's, a, he's what I would call a good lump of a horse. And when you're trying to assemble 400 horses in an Orbe cell, he's a good lump of a horse by a sire that was really beginning to really motor on last year. I mean, a really exciting sire. And he's a good lump of a horse, a perfectly adequate pedigree. He is back of his knee. I mean, he is back of his knee. There's no, that, I mean, I, I, you know, uh, Moret's been kind of saying he's flat of his knee. I actually think he's a bit back of his knee in that photograph. But I mean, I would have said flat of my knee when I was talking to you, Jack, I'm sure at the time you were selling him rather than saying, I think he's back of his knee because I would have been... <laughs> and Moret is, Moret is only on the first lap of this particular track. I think I'm on my fourth time looking at him. What I'm really distressed is that I would have actually had notes on this horse, A, as a f horse on the farm last summer, and I'd have had probably notes from him in Goths as well. So I'm disappointed I haven't got them, but they're, they're in Kildare and I'm in Westmead. So, but you know, he is, a, from my point of view as an auctioneer, he's a good lump of a horse. He was always gonna have a very, an above average value for a sale that I'm trying to compile. And we would be very pleased to catalog him. You know, he's a perfectly good lump of a horse. I, and what I think is interesting, and I'd like to ask the, my fellow panelists this, you know, the age of video selling, and Marette mentioned that she's a great one for video. You know, she's really into videos. Is she into these videos or is she into the galloping? Is it two-year-olds galloping she's into? I'm just interested. It's the, the breeze videos. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I mean, at the moment, the world, I mean, I wrote in the Irish field yesterday. I mean, the world is obsessed by online selling at the moment. Obviously, we're under a bit of pressure mm -hmm. to assemble a live sale. Um, and as I've said, I, I think it's an unsatisfactory way of drawing a conclusion on an unraced horse. I read, as I said also in the Irish Field yesterday, I read an article last week about online orgies. And I really think an online orgy is about the most unsatisfactory comparison I can have <laughs> to an online, um, an online sale of untried lots. Because, you know, Moret has taken against this horse on the, 
fundamentally she doesn't feel he's got enough movement for her, I think, on the video. But, you know, he may well have enough movement, this horse, in the flesh. We don't know. Mm -hmm. He's walking on grass. So in fairness, you've walked him on grass for the video, which is suggesting, you know, you're giving him every chance. And I would say his walk is a little disappointing on grass for a video. That would be my view. And Mags, you have said two things tonight, which are you need movement and you can't be back at the knee. And <laughs> allegedly this horse possesses both. Does he have any redeeming features for you to keep him on the list? Well, first of all, we'll move on. One from Night of Thunder. I don't understand Dubawi. I mean, he is the most amazing stallion and I can look at 20 when I'm cheeky enough to ask somebody if I can see their Dubawi um, and look at 20 in book one or 20 in Goffs and I think, how is this going to be a racehorse? And you look up their notes in two years time. It's extraordinary because they don't have action. They're very tricky in front. However, look at the amazing racehorses he has. Now, I slightly cheated, and unlike Nick, I did have my catalogue here, and my yearling notes on this horse said, okay for size, good top, very average action, no in front for me. <laughs> the reverse... That's the polite version, is it, Max? The, re the reverse of that for Nick, when he says he thinks he should have better movement for a horse that's on grass, I actually think he's moving better than I, my notes tell me I thought of him at the sale. Okay. Okay. Well, perhaps we got you in a better mood this week than we got you at the golf <laughs> when you took him off the list. However, okay, he so is still back of his knee. <laughs> he is. We can't change that. <laughs> but let's move, on to our, let's move on to our next one. And that is the Bellardo filly. The Bellardo, there we have it. Um, Nick, you touched upon a sire line that perhaps has a plainer head earlier. Well, could that could that be this filly? Well, I, I, I mean, I, for me, she's she's a sort of you know relatively ordinary offering. I mean, she just doesn't leap out at me. She's a, uh, I mean, she's struggling a little bit because she is a she's a filly by a first season sire, and I I I. I mean, capable of giving her the total benefit of the doubt on that basis straight away. Um, but she is by Bellardo. Bellardo is by Lope de Vega. And Lope de Vega, is not uncommon for Lope de Vegas to maybe be less um, defined around the head than other sires, perhaps. And to an even greater extent, Shamadal, his sire as well. So, you know, the head itself, that slight kind of crest there between the eyes, a slight kind of lack of just absolutely straight down. That's a sort of a very forgivable trait in this horse, I would have thought, starting straight at the head. As I've said, I, I don't pretend to know a lot about horses. I tend to know about what people buying horses might want to buy and uh, whether it's the right reason or the wrong reason. I'm like the guy selling chips and chocolate to kids outside the school. They should be buying apples and water, but they want chips and chocolate. So I'm going to give them chips and chocolate because that's what I'm, you know, we're paid to put together a, a selling thing. But I do think that this horse may turn out to be superstar but just for me it's it, it, there's an, a, a, just a limit she just is a sort of she doesn't really appeal to me she's a bit shelly a bit plain unproven sire oldish mare just doesn't really like my fire be interested to hear what i hope you were going to ask me last on this also i'll be honest with you jack I really hope you were going to ask me last and then I was we'll, gonna, we'll relegate we'll relegate you to last on i was going to endorse i was going to endorse the views of the other two um mags is this, is this chocolate and candy to you or is this like a very plain salad? Um, I think she's right in the middle there, Jack. Um, I don't know if that was a very big lad or if she really is pretty small. 
but she's sweet and she's racy and I didn't see her as a yearling um, but I think just looking at it there I think the most <laughs> my expansive notes which tell you very little about her really I probably would have written on my page a bay filly I yeah. don't hate her. I don't love her. There's nothing wrong with her. There's nobody in the world could say she's not a runner, but she's just a bay filly. And she's a stocking filler at a sale, really, isn't she, Mags? I mean, she's not a, she's just not a feature horse. She's a horse that, you know, people trying to fill an order will buy. Yeah. And I think she's the sort of filly that you'd probably see her on the outside ring, follow her through if you had an order to fill and Obviously, depending on where the hammer was going to come down, you'd have to say she's fine at that price, but you know she's not going to be for your bigger man. Okay, well, Moret, what kind of reflections did you have when you looked at this filly? Not for our other two panelists. Anything about for you about her that you liked? Um, well, I, I thought she had a good demeanor. She looked. She's a very pretty. She's quite an elegant filly when she's standing there. Um, to me, she's the kind of filly, when you're talking about Owen online and racing this summer, she's probably going to take a little bit of time because she feels a little bit weak. She's light framed. She's not got a ton of muscle behind. Um, she kind of leads with her knees. So I'm sort of with the others. You know, there are things to like about her. There's, there's not much to dislike about her. She's got a nice long neck. She's elegant. Um, She's a little bit flat chested. She's her, uh, she's by a stallion that could do it. There's nothing to say that he won't. He was a very impressive two year old and he won the Lockinge and her broodmare sires, but Unfun Wayne is a very good broodmare sire. So at a certain price, you would take a chance with her possibly, but she wouldn't be my first choice. Okay, great. Well, that is our Bellardo filly. Our final filly is the New Bay filly. And what's interesting, just before we go, actually, what's interesting with the Bellardo filly, and it's really interesting to hear the panellists' thoughts, of course, these are the videos at a yearling stage, but actually I rang Johnny Murta to discuss them, and this filly is the earliest of the three filly, uh, horses on show, which so just shows you it's a mad world <sighs> that that might be the case. Whether or not she's fast, let's see. But she's the earliest, he thinks. Um, so this is our New Bay filly. That's the new Bay filly. Moret, what were your initial thoughts when you had to look at her? Actually, I thought she was quite a nice filly. She doesn't have the biggest walk in the world, but it's a very active walk. She's got some bone. Um, she's quite balanced. She's got a good look in her eye. Um, she's got a good forearm. You know, her front end to back end is balanced. Um, uh, quite a nice gaskin and hip. So uh, they were, I, I liked her. She's her she's out of a good mare that was a good race filly that's produced a good horse so when i look at the pedigree page aligned with her there there are things that i like and new you know new bay is acceptable he's had he had three stakes winners in his first crop so for me i would be okay with all of that okay great and heather anderson jack fogarty will patterson they all did great homework in connection with this filly and Mags, we talked about uh, sons of Dabawi, uh, Sire sons. Uh, what did you think of this filly, another uh, new bay who, of course, is by Dabawi? I like this filly very much. My yearling notes tell me I liked her as well. Um, I think it's amazing. It just shows there are no rules in this game. You have the other two that we've seen 
by milers who are you know well known uh, like for precocity and whatever and the same with their family and here we have the filly who's by a mile and a half horse she's an april 29th foal and yet she's the most forward of the three so luckily there are no rules i think she's very racy i like her okay great and nick when you're thinking about first season sires and people have first season sires in their field right now is is that something that you want for the Orby? Is that, is that something that's part of your kind of makeup and making a premier sale? Well, there's a good bunch of first season size every year and there's a lesser bunch of first season size every year. So, I mean, you know, there's the gin and the tonic and um, we, we obviously want the gin. Um, I mean, New Bay is a classic winner by, a classic winner by Jubawi. Um, you know, you have to say the previous classic winner by Dubawi was Knight of Thunder, who we saw earlier on, and he went on to have a cracking first season last year. So, I would, uh, yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to like the idea of, um, you'd have to like the idea of New Bay. I think he was the second most expensive freshman sire stood in Ireland that time. You know, a couple of years ago. So, he's at the higher end of that particular desire level, and I'm, I'm being stupid and not remembering who the others were. I have it pinned in front of my, as I said, if this is only in my office, I have it pinned in front of me every year, every generation. But there's, there can be up to 20 fresh season size every year. So you could nearly fill an entire catalog with first season size. And obviously, you know, we don't all want to be test pilots. There is an element of risk with that first one. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's desirable, but it, you know, the first season size wants to be over a good man as, Moret said, you know, Lucky Pippet, she's a stakes winning mare, she's a stakes winning producing mare. You know, she's, a, she's got a better chance of doing a favour to the freshman sire than a lot of other mares. Okay, great. Well, that's our three horses. And now, of course, Nick, sometimes we walk into an auction ring and we have to actually pick out our horse and bid on it. And that's what we're going to do right now because we're going to poll which horse would you buy? So we're going to allow the panellists to have a vote too. I'm going to launch the poll here. So we've heard the thoughts as we progress through the evening. Let's see how we go. So, so this, is to, this is to us or to everybody else? Everyone, everyone, the whole. So we've had over 120 votes now. There's a strong leader at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. I'll share the results. And our winner is the New Bay Philly. So the New Bay Philly won. Second was the Night of Thunder. And the Bellardo was third. Now, I'm delighted to report I didn't sell the New Bay Philly. So there are shares still available in that <laughs> Philly, um, which is a very exciting proposition for you all that voted for all 102 of you, which is uh, you'll all be receiving an email afterwards, which are uh, linked by. No, no, there are shares available. I, I will not lie. But, you know, that just shows. There, there was a, uh, two great judges commenting how much they liked the filly. And sometimes, you know, the buyers aren't there and they, we don't sell them. But hopefully she's fast on the race course this year for Johnny Murta. Right. It's now we're going to ask. A few, now, let's start asking questions and stop the sales pitch. Um, Moret, a question for you for Peter Appleton. Um, do you ever change your mind following first impressions? And is, that something, is it an evolving process? How many times would you like to look at a horse before you buy it? Oh, I think I drive people crazy because I look, I go back and look at them time after time after time because I think the more you see them, the more you learn about them. And as we all know, you can have a good looking horse in front of you, but 90% of the horses are ordinary. And there's just a less than 1% in any given crop is a grade one winner. And I'm all about trying to find that grade one winner, whatever the price is, 5,000, 50, 500. So I think, and we know with humans, the winning traits are, you know, competitive capacities, determination, all those things. And you, you can't just judge a horse by what they look like physically. You have to try and figure out, are they somebody? Who are they? Or are they nobody? So that's a very important part for me is to see them a lot. Mags, there's a question for you from Keno Sullivan. And is there, is there a yearling that you've kind of in your mind that you're going to kind of go, oh, for God's sake, that was the one that got away that you regret? And was there a reason at the time that you didn't buy it? 
Ooh. You usually lack of money. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's always a bit of a difficulty. I think, yeah, I think that's a common enough problem, isn't it? Um, and, and, you know, like Moret, I would like to, I want to see all those horses twice. Well, certainly everything once, then your shorter list, and then your short list again. Uh, twice is good for me. Four times it might happen as well. But I can get as far as having it vetted, getting somebody lined up and G'd up on it, getting the top amount of money I can get from them in case I can't get them on the phone. But if a horse puts up a bad display on the outside ring, be it sweating, <laughs> temperament, not the action I was looking for, I'll just drop them there and then. Okay, okay. The poor vendors hearing that, I'm sure they're sweating already here, hearing <laughs> that uh, bad news, how, how difficult they are. Well, it's better if they sweat rather than their horse. Yes. I know, I know. And Nick, I suppose I think a lot of vendors were, you know, we're facing into an uncertain period. And, you know, we, we have horses, we produce the full crop and we are going to need to sell those foals in the coming weeks and months ahead. You know, in terms of working with goths and how goths can play a role in selling those horses and what they should be doing now to do that. Is there any advice you'd have uh, from that perspective? Well, I think there, there, there are some people who are facing a more immediate um, quandary than others. Obviously, the, the, the sale season that should be really underway is the breeze up sale season. Um, and that's an important outlet because if that pipe becomes blocked, that's an important part of the yearling buying bench. So uh, I think the priority of all the auction houses at the moment is to uh, assist the breeze up vendors with being able to get their horses to a market. But not just getting them to the market, we've got to be very hopeful that racing has resumed and appetite to own racehorses is rekindled, that certain first season sires get off and running with some winners and that we have a market in place to move the breeze up horses on to new homes. I think it's important, I was saying earlier on to somebody that, you know, there is a sort of myth, you know, everyone's very concerned about the breeze up horses, but it's arguable that the two best graduates of the European breeze up sales last year actually were top three-year-olds. Um, there was a, a war of will on the Preakness stakes in America. He was consigned as a breeze up horse by Norman Williamson and an amazing achievement for a European breeze up vendor to produce an American triple crown winner. But he, he, he obviously peaked in the Preakness. And then there was a uh, channel who won the pre and the French Oaks, which would have been in June. And that's obviously the, a, a classic winning filly. So there is sometimes that, there, you know, it is important that, that buyers remember that the breeze up horses don't just sort of represent a sort of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, one night stand as a two-year-old racer. These are some very high quality horses and it's extremely important that we allow them to move because rather like the bloodstock industry is a bit like a pipe and we don't need the pipe to be blocked in front for the yearlings coming through and then the foals. And on the national hunt, there's obviously a bit of a hiatus with the pointer pointers and the young horses. Um, and that, that's a, a problem as well. But the, obviously most flat horses have a two year shelf life, whereas most pointer pointers and store horses really can reasonably expect to have four or five racing years ahead of them. Um, so that the panic isn't quite as great, but we are working very hard as a body of sales companies. There's never been more correspondence between the three major European auction houses and we have a weekly discussions about how we can all make sure that everybody helps. So there is a kind of a, there's a bit of a ceasefire at the moment in competitive terms, and we're working hopefully to best advantage to make sure that the varying blockages um, that are maybe going to prevent some liquidity in the market later in the year can be unblocked to the, you know, the mutual help of the industry. Okay, here, here, Nick. And uh, I suppose we're speaking about breeze ups to be remiss of me not to touch upon Breeze Ups with uh, uh, the successful buyer of a Breeders' Cup Juvenile winner from the Breeze Ups, and that's Moret Farrell. And Moret, when you're looking at these videos in the coming months and you're trying to look at a good breeze, is there something about a breeze that you particularly like beyond just the time? Um, yes, I actually half the time, time is not that important to me. And here I am buying Breeze Up horses in America where time is everything, but for me, it's the way they do it. It's the smoothness of their stride, the length of their stride, their balance as they, as they move, um, the, their energy, their rhythm that they keep it going. They maintain it all the way through the breeze. Um, 
I'm not so much, a lot of the buyers in the US uh, time the gallop out. So they time the next eighth or a quarter and they basically, that's part of their equation. Again, I, I really, I don't, we don't time them. It's not that important to me because it's the way they gallop out is the key for me. That they go around the turn like a bicycle, that they keep their rhythm, they, they keep their power as they, they go out there. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, that I have somebody on the backside, Tesha von Blucher, who works with me a lot, and she watches them, they're breathing on the backside, which is very, very important. I'm with Mags on that. They're breathing. If you can't breathe, you can't run. And uh, she'll watch them, how they jog or walk home, and if they're sound, um, that's a very important part of it for me after the fact. And we go see any of the ones we like as soon as possible. And Mags, I suppose you, you're frequently involved in buying for this market and trying to think through what is going to make a runner in terms of a breeze up horse. Is there a particular type that's different to if you're buying to race or is it just all the one? You're just looking for an athlete. What is, what, when you're looking for a breeze up horse, what do you kind of do? Well, you want a horse with strength because, you know, you're going to have to be getting after these horses a lot earlier than a horse that's just, you know, maybe being a trainer can take time with in the at the race course if these horses they've only got six months we're buying them in october and we want to sell them in april so they've got to have strength um and you know i i don't think you can really i, I think it's very hard to buy a late april or may foal because um you're asking them huge questions and they're probably not ready for it Okay, great. And I suppose that's an interesting question for you, Nick, in terms of, and it's something uh, touched upon by um, Charlie McCarthy here, is how is important is the birthday of a foal? You know, a lot of vendors are out there, you know, it's uncertain times. They're not sure if they'll cover their mares again. You know, is a May foal, an April foal, is a later foal a, a difficulty for you getting into the premier sales? Yeah, well, I think I think it is. Yes, I mean, you've just heard Mag say that she's not for a large sector of the market. A late April or a May foal is is something that she's going to overlook. So you'd be fairly um, foolish not to listen to an opinion like that and take it on board when you're compiling a catalogue. So, you know, I've got two horses left of one place and two horses. There's one here that Mags O'Toole might buy, and there's one here that Mags O'Toole won't buy. I'd be a very foolish uh, sort of cataloger if I put the one in that I know is immediately eliminated by a section of the buyer base. It's not all important, but I would say to any breeder who's thinking, should I or shouldn't I cover my mare? It's pretty likely they shouldn't at any stage because that is in itself a problem. You know, I mean, I, that's my rule. And particularly, I think, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting ride in the next 18 months and supply and demand balancing the two will be a key objective of the industry. I would say anyone who's thinking, you know, fair enough now for a week or two, but there does come a point if you're going to say, am I going to cover my mare? Um, I think it's a, it's a question that I nearly know the answer to without asking any further information. Okay, there we have it. Some... Can I Go say ahead, something? I, I actually yes. feel slightly differently. And as it happens, Storm the Court is a me baby, but that's just a by the by. But there are a number of Kentucky Derby winners that are May babies, a number of top class horses that are May babies. And there was a, it was something that I retweeted a, a few weeks ago about the May babies in the September sale last year at Keeneland. And they, they were the highest sellers, which is quite interesting. I was quite surprised at that one. But for me, I'm, an end, I'm a buyer for end users. I am very happy to look at May babies. I love that they were born in the sunshine. They've got the sun on their backs. They've got the good grass. I personally don't like the January babies where they, to me, they're stunted. Um, they don't have that good grass at the beginning. And um, so for what that's worth, for those people out there that are naysayers, there are some of us out there that do look for that. And the results are good. You can produce good racehorses, which is, the bottom line for all of us. I think that's Can I a really just clarify something? Sorry. I, of course, I look at Mayfalls, no problem. I'm just thinking from the breeze up point of view, I think it's okay. very tough on them. I'm mm -hmm. no problem. And that's, I, I agree with Mayfalls you, Max. To go that to, is as an end user. Yeah. I'm right. sorry, Jack, to clarify, I don't think you shouldn't cover your mouth. 
because of the polling day. And I think if you're wondering if you should cover your mayor, I'm presuming your mayor is of a quality issue that combined with the late yes. polling date isn't going to be okay. a very good thing. I mean, if I happen to have a good mayor and I'm lucky enough to be involved with one or two, I would have no problem with having a later fold. But I can tell you that if you are of the tonic department and not the gin, it's extremely <laughs> difficult to sell a horse anyway, but it's much more difficult to sell when it's a late fold. That's all I'm saying. Okay, brilliant. Well, I think we should end on that moment of optimism from Moresh that we should all go out and we'll breed a Kentucky Derby winner. There'll be someone watching right now that was not so certain about breeding their mare, but they have been <laughs> void by the fact Marek Farrell told them that at they what, should. At so, what point does Moret feel we should stop covering? <laughs> yeah, I think after that you need to stop, for sure. So what's the, what's the late? May, after we May get the Kentucky Derby enough. winner. Late, okay. uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so mid June. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to our three panellists. It was a wonderful evening to share with them tonight. Thank you. Uh, this is the third of, uh, episode of The Art of the Mating. We're going to do one each week. Next week is National Hunt. Uh, Mags will be excited to uh, hear that Apple's Jade is on the list mm -hmm. to be uh, mated this year. Let's see what uh, everyone thinks in terms of her mating. We're going to also have a look at Honeysuckle and Benny the Deux. Um, so that's our, what's ahead of us next week. Thank you for everyone for joining. If you have feedback, ways that, that we can improve it, things you want to learn about, please send it to me on my Twitter account uh, on the screen. Uh, thank you very much to our three panellists and have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, Jack, very much. Thank you. Bye.